I just love this retroactive reshaping of history and of things of a physical nature. This is our government. They got together the best marksmen from the FBI and the military. They didn't come to, uh, to Mark Lane or Tim Thompson or Sylvia Marr, uh, others who were early involved. Uh, they didn't say, hey, uh, do you have somebody that shoots a weapon? Uh, they got the people that they could find that were the best without allowing time for re re aiming and repositioning at a moving target without being concerned with accuracy 2.3 seconds. That was incredible. As they said on the TV program about three, four weeks ago, the 2.3 seconds have been reduced now to less than one and a half seconds. Blakey, I think himself, you know, he was, oh, he became a shooter after uh, they brought him in. They needed somebody of a more sycophantic nature after they forced Dick Sprague out. Uh, they wanted somebody who would be compliant. And uh, he said, uh, this uh, professor of law from Notre Dame, I think, well, he, he could shoot in 2.1 seconds. All right, you want 2.1 seconds, but now Mark Furman has taken it to less than one and a half seconds. Incredible. And another beautiful thing on the program, and he had the first five minutes as a fellow Fox TV colleague, and then he left. Um, he didn't stick on the program with Geraldo. Uh, he, uh, he made, you're going to love this, made a statement that this case was one that J. Edgar Hoover wanted to bust open in the biggest way. I mean, this, he just, he had to be restrained. I mean, what he was ready to undertake and did undertake indeed, and so on. Um, you like that? And another comment he, he made too was, uh, he referred to those of you who have written books. I've never gotten around to, to writing books. I'm ashamed of it, I've only written articles. But those of you who have written books, it said Bill O'Reilly, um, who makes Genghis Khan look like an ultra-liberal, uh, liberal, um, <laughs> Bill, Bill O'Reilly Bill made a pejorative comment about book writers who have made all this money and are making all this money. Right? Right? Um, just says that Tim Thompson is really a multi -man. He may look like a schlepper, but he's a multi <laughs> 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 So, uh, this is from Bill O'Reilly. This is the kind of, of craziness, as a wonderful uh, Jewish word, narishkeit, uh, childish nonsense uh, that goes on. And this is what we all have to deal with. So let's talk about some of the things that, uh, where are we? I'm pressing our, I go, go up again, folks? Okay, all right. Now you saw and you've seen all that. And I just want to go through this hurriedly. Um, the movements have been discussed. Uh, Tink Thompson has done brilliant stuff. Here is a diagram from the Warren Commission. Not my diagram, their diagram. You all know, of course, that that evening, the autopsy was done at Bethesda Naval Hospital by Humes and Boswell. Uh, Pierre Fink was called over um, somewhat later, an army man in the naval setting, and anything that Pierre uh, suggested, uh, he was immediately told, uh, uh, Doctor, just, just proceed, we'll tell you what to do. Uh, there were three star admirals and generals in the autopsy room. Humes and Boswell, of course, had never done a gunshot in an autopsy in their entire careers. I just said, I was just interviewed uh, for a couple of minutes outside by an old friend, Sheldon Ingram, a WTAA, our ABC channel. And I said to Sheldon, what I've been saying to all of the interviewers who have uh, spent time uh, so graciously with me over the past couple of weeks, I've said to them, and around here, of course, I know them personally, uh, Chris, uh, 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 Ken, whoever, I said, just think, your editor in the newspaper, your news director from the TV station, whatever, says to you, okay, man, this is your big case. The president has just been assassinated. I want you to get your rear end over there. I want you to see what's going on. I want you to tell our readers, viewers, listeners about the facility. And I really want you to know and find out who's doing the autopsy. This is going to be interesting, okay? And you go over and you find out that the two guys who are going to do the autopsy on the President of the United States, multiple gunshot wounds. You've got to determine angle, distance, trajectory, sequence. You've got to correlate those wounds with John Connolly's wounds. And you find out that these two guys have never done a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire lives. Never done a single gunshot wound autopsy.
If you read about this occurring in any other country, you would, in a condescending, dismissive, somewhat uh, arrogant fashion, um, uh, smug American type manner, well, what the hell do you expect uh, uh, from them over there in that country? This was our country. And as I love to say, man, I don't care, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, black, white, Catholic, Muslim, Buddhist, Jew, Protestant, what have you. This should be so, so distressing. This should, should bother you so much even 50 years later to think that this is what they did. And of course, the reason that they did it was because all of the top civilian forensic pathologists in those days shared a common flaw. They were civilians. And you could not be assured that they would follow orders and that they would do things. For example, I pointed out, I, I, just by way of, of corroboration, the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are not mentioned. Have nothing to do with the death or with the assassination. Uh, Addison's uh, uh, disease and so on. But you do a medical legal autopsy at that time, you know, Oswald was still alive. There's going to be a murder case. You know, leave things out in an autopsy. Uh, this just, you know, is, is a kind of corroborative, uh, albeit ancillary, proof of the kind of control that went on. Um, the, um, we're back on track, gentlemen. And uh, Conley's wounds. So, uh, I think it was Tink, showed uh, beautifully the line up there. And that's something else that my colleagues love to do. Uh, well, what if Connolly were seated over, and I think it was they pointed out, yeah, if he was seated maybe half, with half of his buttocks on the floor, or trying to get over onto Nelly's lap because they didn't have a chance to romanticize that morning. Uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, uh, and then, and what if on the business of the wound in the Kennedy's back being lower than the wound in the front of his neck? Well, what if Kennedy were bent on? And you know, that's right, politicians, of course! He had the scratches groin, he had to tie his shoelace, what the hell doesn't care about the crowd, right? Um, uh, politicians do it all the time. But this is the kind of stuff that I've been dealing with and, and you've been hearing about. And then, of course, you had a reference to Vincent Gwynn, just one of the early scientists. I can't be sure whether he really believed it or not, or whether he just went along. But now, um, Randage and... <clears throat> And uh, Grant have shown that it is absolutely scientifically false to say that you can <clears throat> identify a fragment uh, to a particular bullet to the exclusion of every other bullet in the world. There's no question about that. Now, just want to now talk about uh, the specifics of the single bullet theory. You've already seen, um, Bob has shown you, uh, take refer to it, the trajectory that the single bullet theory, Commission Exhibit 399, the stretcher bullet, um, uh, has been credited for. The vertical and horizontal gyrations, absolutely impossible. Okay. And uh, that, of course, is a very solid, strong scientific reason. As I say, despite the Warren Commission, um, the fact of the matter is, bullets do move in a straight line. Then you have the, there's what the trajectory would have been, it would have missed Conley completely, no question about it, if it had indeed been fired, as they say, like that. Um, and then, secondly, we have the condition of the bullet. Uh, that's been referred to also by our wonderful presentations uh, this morning. This bullet broke the right fifth rib, Another piece was found on the back of the car by Mrs. Kennedy, and here she is looking at the back of the president's head, seeing the exit wound, and then climbing out onto the trunk to pick up a piece of his head. She picked it up, she brought it back into the car and tried to piece it together. Her testimony was, and I quote, from the back you could see, you know, you were trying to hold his hair on and his skull on. She couldn't, there was nothing there. There's some shots that miss completely. There's some, some debate about some of these. For instance, here, I have examined this picture uh, taken at the, in the middle of the shooting uh, for years. I cannot find any damage to the windshield at all. Other people claim that they can. I can't. 
but a moment later in the next shot, there is damage to the windshield and shows the sun reflecting off of a crack. Now, where the debate comes in here is that there are witnesses who said that they saw a complete through and through hole at the hospital. Did they? Maybe. Uh, is it there now? No. The, um, the windshield that is in the National Archives now shows a spider-shaped uh, hole very much like this, but it's not a through and through hole. This raises the question, was the um, windshield replaced twice? Once to, hold, to hide a through and through hole, and the other one uh, to show a replacement being made. Uh, the chrome over the windshield on the inside, from the rear, shows that a bullet did strike just above the, the windshield itself. Another bullet was found uh, in Dealey Plaza, right by the uh, manhole cover on the south side of Elm Street. It was picked up by a man who's been described as Robert Barrett, an FBI agent, although that's not confirmed. Whoever this guy is, he picks it up, holds it in his hand, puts it into his pocket, and we never see it again. Western Medical Center in Dallas uh, has, to my knowledge, been consistent over the years in what he saw. Uh, he was a senior attending uh, member of the, of the surgical staff at Parkland Memorial Hospital on November 22, 1963, when President Kennedy was brought in. Uh, later, he would also be involved in uh, the uh, life-saving efforts with Lee Harvey Oswald. He may address that as well this afternoon, if we have time. But uh, I'm going to uh, defer to the technical crew now, and hopefully we're going to have Dr. McClellan on the screen. Well, on that day, uh, November 22nd, um, I was about two days after my 34th birthday. I will be 84 next month. So after this elapse of 50 years, uh, a lot of thoughts have come to me. But on that day, I was in the operating room at Parkland, and I was showing a film about how to repair a high hernia to several of the senior surgery residents when I heard a little tap on the conference room door where I was showing that film. I went to the door and looked out at Dr. Charles Crenshaw, Chuck Crenshaw, one of our other senior surgery residents, uh, was standing there and asked me to step outside because he needed to tell me something. <clears throat> so I shut off the uh, movie projector, stepped outside, and he said that they just called the emergency room and said that they're bringing President Kennedy in because he's been shot during his... And they want all of the surgical faculty, uh, and there were four of us at that time, whereas now there are 56, uh, they want all of the surgical faculty in the emergency room uh, immediately. So having been told that, uh, Dr. Crenshaw and I got on the elevator in the operating room. Please welcome. Whoa, I don't, I must have gone down the rabbit hole because this is not the country I thought it was even 
after two decades of journalism, uh, the, 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 the deep politics, the real understanding of how power in this country works is not something to which journalists are privy. And it's even worse if you live in Washington, D.C., which fortunately I don't, but you, you get so stuck in the machine and you need those sources of the Pentagon and all of these other people and you really don't have the time. Most of them are not very intellectual. Cyril Wax, who I love, I, I met him in 1991, he still looks the same. <laughs> I call him Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> and we need love, just did three today, just, he keeps his hand in. But his passion, his love of his case extends, even today, he was yelling to me, telling me how excited he was, about eyes like a young teenager, about this guy McClellan, Dr. McClellan, at the autopsy report, came out today at an old age, 84 years old or something, on television and finally said, you know, I was there and there was a huge amount of damage to the front of the, of the head and also, and much more to the back. Just clearly as day, and of course, as he said, it won't make, it will not make page one, it should be made. He was there for at least eight minutes, at least eight minutes. Uh, Dr. Fink, Dr. Uh, Fink, uh, who was the other one? Uh, yeah. Boswell, uh, you know, no, Boswell and Hughes were the uh, fools, you told me. Fink was a great, great hero who came out of the garrison trial. Thank God he spoke what he did. But people are scared. But Clement was scared. He couldn't open his mouth today. And that's what Russ Baker was saying. It's a, it's a self-censorship of our own minds. Now, that was a very haunting remark. We're all scared. Every one of us. I'm scared. Less to be scared of, Dr. Cyril Wecht is less to be scared of. But this is what, why I made the movie centered around Jim Garrison. And if many of you may not agree with Garrison or not, thank God Joan Mellon is here, and Jim and Judio, and people who will defend his honor. But I do that now.
how can the, the issue of national security involved? And uh, the judge agreed in order that the documents be released, and then we got not all of them, but uh, enough so that we were swamped. Uh, and that's also an effort made by the government. They gave us documents which had nothing to do uh, with uh, the, anything related to Dallas in November of 63, uh, a, a meeting about uh, a Jack Kennedy's trip to Paris, to do this. I mean, the thousands and thousands of things. It's and to do with Jack Martin who figured prominently in Jim, Jack Martin was the person who on the weekend of the assassination knocked on the door of the uh, district attorney's office in New Orleans and said, you know, Oswald knew David Ferry. Just want to tell you that. And uh, so that uh, the uh, garrison's office immediately went to try to find David Ferry on the, on, the, on the Sunday after the assassination. The Office of Security revealed it had denied the church committee four sets of records from its volume six. These files refer to a man named Jack Martin, or John G. Martin, or Joseph James Martin. So many Jack Martins, what is this? Of all the people CIA felt it necessary to shield, they chose these two. They didn't choose Ferry, by the way, they didn't choose Clay Shaw. We see the same CIA protection of Jack Martin in documents included in Russ Holmes' Clay Shaw file. <laughs> There are pages listing the names of people associated, quote, directly or indirectly, this is CIA's language, with Shaw. Each of the names was then subjected to a name trace through CIA's, quote, Records Integration Division, R.I.D. The only name that would not be subjected to a trace was Jack Martin. Today's CIA director Colby had delivered a family jewels document to the Ford White House. Um, some of you may know that in 2007, this document was finally released to the public, although much of it was old news at that point, and the redactions and the blackouts began on the signature page. Um, uh, in any case, it, occlu it included revelations of other abuses, um, including wiretapping of reporters, opening of mail, and assassination plots. Now, there have been rumors circulating from time to time about assassination plots against Fidel Castro, Cuba's leader. Um, but it turned out it was President Ford himself who let the cat out of the bag. He was at a White House lunch with New York Times editors and was asking their, for their forbearance in all these revelations because, quote, it would blacken the reputation of every president since Truman if they wrote about them. Um, when quizzed about what he was talking about, he said, like assassinations. Um, and the New York Times editors actually didn't publish this comment, but it got linked to Daniel Shore, who soon did. Um, so what happened next is that Ford uh, appointed his vice president, Nelson Rockefeller, and created a commission on CIA activities in the United States. Um, but both houses of Congress also quickly followed suit with their own investigations. Uh, now, the Rockefeller Commission um, they did receive evidence of the CIA assassination plots, but didn't take that on as an issue. Uh, in general, they conducted a pretty circumscribed probe. Uh, former Warren Commission staff member uh, David Bellin was their executive director. Um, they did uh, publish a report about CIA domestic spying and mail opening. Um, and they actually took on two questions related to the Kennedy assassination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for all attending. Uh, I just wanted to, by way of introductory remarks, uh, sort of tie some things up because Joan Mellon gave a great talk this morning. And she talked about how um, the president has sort of surrendered to the CIA, which JFK did not do. Uh, JFK was going to appoint Bobby Kennedy as head of the CIA and re reform it, which was a major, major issue in this whole investigation. But then last night, a gentleman from the Boston Globe talked about how the media covers uh, matters of national security. And uh, between the two, Joan, of course, is right. 
if uh, the media were covering national security. And let me put it another way. If all of the researchers, as you've heard, all of the authorities were to focus on getting the truth today, how much better off would our society be? The agency was not able to remove HMMA 22307 from the chronological file while it had been removed from the project file. If we had not asked for the chronological file, which we found out about from another document where we found a reference and therefore had asked for it, uh, we would have never seen HMMA 22307. HMMA 22307 is the dispatch that indicates that the impulse camera was tested for a period that was to last 48 days beginning on 27 September 1963. It promised that the film would be sent to Headquarters Technical Service Division, HMA 22307, was dated 18 October 1963. On 18 October 1963, they had the production from the impulse camera. The next dispatch monthly report said in November that we did find in the project file enclosed samples of photographs taken by the impulse cameras. It also reported that the impulse camera had generated 10 feet of 16 millimeter film. We never saw those photos. Ben, thank you so much, and thank you and your father for the putting on this wonderful con uh, conference for all of us. Uh, we have here on our panel uh, literally hundreds of years of experience in thinking about this case and going all the way back to the beginning with Mark Lane who begins with just uh, days after the assassination and with the Warren Commission. So given that we have this expertise and it's 50 years, we're approaching 50 years and that's an important milestone, what we thought we would try to do is do a lessons learned exercise. And they say that lessons learned is important. I read that our current president likes to do lessons learned exercises that he picked up from the military, apparently. So we're, we're going to do that in our own context and uh, look at what lessons have been learned, not so much in the minute detail of specific facts, but what lessons have we as a society learned from the 50-year period, from the official investigations, from the state of where we are. And because we're at 50 years, we're beginning to think in terms of posterity here. And I looked up posterity in my dictionary, and it says future generations. And so because we have this wonderful collection of, of history and talent on this case, um, I'm going to call on each of the panelists and ask them for say seven minutes or so, of, of what lessons they think we can learn. Uh, the way of accomplishing that the best we can. Um, it helps, particularly if you're seeking congressional oversight, to be able to formulate um, an issue that may have popular support. I think there are two such issues that uh, are now present, that can be pressed and should be pressed with the hope of getting popular support and official action. One is the issue of the uh, release of the still withheld JFK Act records. That's an issue likely to have popular support and I think does have popular support because People are upset with the idea that 50 years after the assassination, they still do not know everything. They do not have access to all of the records. So that is an issue that needs to be uh, pushed. And it, given the fact that the JFK Act has never had any oversight hearings regarding the performance of the review board and the successes and failures of that legislation, even though it is recognized and established that it was highly unique legislation passed by a unanimous Congress. Mr. Stone, um, we're excited about him because of the JFK movie. And that's quite understandable and appropriate. And of course, uh, with an audience like this, 
We are extremely enthusiastic, but setting that aside, uh, keep in mind, this is one of the most accomplished, uh, successful, and highly respected filmmakers, dramatists. Uh, this is a, a gentleman who has achieved the highest pinnacle of success uh, in his field. And so it is a great honor for us to have him here. He's going to talk to us uh, this evening about his brand new book, um, The Untold History of the United States. It's a beautiful book uh, that he has authored uh, with Peter Kuznick. And this is not new history. This is taking together everything Peter Kuznick has studied and, and taught history, but he studied under uh, the, 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 the revisionists of the 1960s at Rutgers, at University of Wisconsin. They were all over the place. They started to come up. They were questioning the Cold War because of the Vietnam War. They began to question the whole ethic. What happened to create the Cold War and even World War II? And that was the area that Peter excelled in, starting with his study of scientists in the 1930s and nuclear weapons and so forth. So that became the basis of our series, and that's where we launched it. And then the book followed from that, and basically is an outgrowth of the TV series. Two. You know, uh, just a quick aside here. The, the, uh, most of us know, of course, about the Bay of Pigs invasion, but that week was a remarkable week, actually. The, uh, in terms of the, this split, this very uh, bitter split that was developing so early in the Kennedy presidency between the president and the CIA. Because that very same week, there's a, uh, a uh, flurry of very in, uh, of intrigue in, in Paris, uh, and a crisis in Paris. Uh, the French president, Charles de Gaulle, is of, has been targeted by the secret army organization, a far-right splinter group within his own military, who's broken away from de Gaulle over de Gaulle's uh, settlement of the war in Algeria. And uh, led by a renegade military officer in the French military, Maurice Schall, there's a coup underway, an attempted coup in uh, Paris, right around the time of the Bay of Pigs. Well, de Gaulle's government leaks word to the European press, ends up finally in the US press, that he believes the CIA is behind this attempted coup because de Gaulle has been seen as a a stubborn nationalist who's challenging the United States policy on many fronts. And it becomes another big issue for JFK to contend with at the very same time. He's furious. He has to send Pierre Salinger, of course, who can speak French, uh, to Paris to sort of uh, calm the waters and assure the de Gaulle administration that the Kennedy White House is not behind this coup, and hopefully not his own CIA. De Gaulle gave him a pass but said that Kennedy was not in control of his own CIA. So th this is a, uh, an important, I think, uh, you know, footnote, perhaps, maybe more important than a footnote in the Kennedy presidency, and particularly the fact that this happened at the same time as the Bay of Pigs is very significant. Alan Dulles' 40-year intelligence career ended when Kennedy fired him over the seat of the Bay of Pigs. He was now sitting at home watching as JFK was tearing apart piece by piece this whole imperial empire that him and his brother had been working on since when? Anybody know when they started it? The Dulles brothers supervised the mandate thing at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Okay? How the European countries would go in and control all those oil-rich countries in the Middle East. All right? And that's why Dulles went in to Iran in 1954 to save the country for Aramco against Mossadegh nationalizing the oil companies. All right, And so here he's watching this happen. So I don't think it's a coincidence that all these people around Oswald, James Angleton, you know, George of Orange Shell, Hunt, Phillips, okay, the Paines, I don't think it's a coincidence that they're like one step away from Alan Dulles. All right? I also don't think it's a, a coincidence he was the most active agent of the Warren Commission cover-up. I don't think it's a coincidence that he hired Gordon Novell to wire Jim Garrison's office. Okay? Since Garrison was the first guy to say in public that what happened to Kennedy was a coup d'etat. Michael Morrissey once wrote a book in which he said the biggest lie of the second half of the 20th century was that Oswald shot Kennedy. He then added that the second biggest lie was that Johnson continued his policies in Vietnam. Well, I would like to say that the third biggest lie is that Kennedy was ever a cold warrior. He was never a cold warrior. All right? 
And unfortunately, because this disinformation machine is so strong, I had to do this 50 years after the fact. All right, thank you. What I'm going to be sharing with you is the confluence of a series of events between Tuesday, November 19th, and Saturday evening. And I hope I get the stuff in the correct order on the overhead, otherwise when I'm done, President Kennedy will still be alive. Uh, please bear with me on that one. Uh, the idea is, if there's a pattern there and you see it, keep digging. Because this is my farewell tour. I'm, I'm done after today. I'm speaking later this afternoon and tonight at the Comedy Club. Uh, so please, uh, if you see something here, and you're going to see some people you may not be too familiar with. Um, and I also need to acknowledge that this is not only my work, but it was the work of a man named Jay Harrison, who died in 2005. Uh, so, the Air Force One tapes are extraordinarily important. I don't know if they'll ever be found, but if you think about it, they are the real-time reaction of the U.S. government to the assassination at the highest level. The, part of the, of the tapes that we have are the cabinet plane, which was en route to Japan, turning around and you can hear Pierre Salinger saying, give me the latest on the president, give me the latest on the president. And we have the story about Curtis LeMay. So we may have the reaction of other government entities, uh, other members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, responding to the assassination. So the complete Air Force One tapes, I think, are a real priority. And I think anybody, anybody who's interested in the assassination, regardless of your point of view, would say that's something that should be on the public record. It's extraordinary that it isn't, so we need to pay attention to that. Uh, on Twitter, I found this fantastic word, propaganda, and I've started using it because when you say propaganda, it has kind of this polite, you know, uh, collegial sound to it. Propaganda is what we're being fed on this case, daily, weekly, and definitely for the next probably 30 days as we approach November 22nd. All right, don't fall for it, support the truth tellers. You know, I post things, if I see some documentary coming out that I know is going to be propaganda, I alert my friends, you know, here's what they're going to say, here's why that's not true. You know, if I don't catch it till after, I do the same. Educate everybody you know. All of you have your power. Use it. And of course, not all conspiracies are theories. I, I, I wrote in, Jim, in a forward to one of Jim G. Eugenia's book, I said, as adults, we have to learn to separate the word conspiracy from the word theory. They are not automatically paired. They are separate things. It's really important. We help deprogram the public. And when people say, like, oh, what's your conspiracy theory? I say, funny you should use that exact term. Do you know the CIA has been trying to get you to say those and connect those two words? I try and deprogram them one at a time. All right, it's a small effort, but if we all did it, you know, ripples have ripples have ripples. <laughs> I worked for Cynthia McKinney in Congress, and she had me draft a bill to take Hoover's name off of that building and put Frank Church's name on it. And uh, if you are going to write Congress, email. Because I yep. worked up there, and when you send a letter, it has to go out somewhere in Ohio and be x-rayed, and all the mail we got was at least a month delay. Yeah. Well, I want to thank these uh, wonderful presenters and panelists. And uh, all the others who 